I'm Fred Ferguson, and Bahamian music is my life. I'm one of the founders of the Grammy Award-winning group, Bahamian. Yeah, those guys. After all these years of playing and recording music, one man remains my personal guitar hero. And it's not only me that he inspired. Generations of well-known guitarists have studied the techniques and style of this Bahamian legend. And in the age of YouTube, he's more popular than ever as guitarists around the world try to emulate his playing. Despite his popularity with guitar players all over the globe, he is relatively unknown and definitely unheralded here in his home country. His name is Joseph Spence, and I'm going to tell you his story. Joseph Spence is one of the most unique persons that God has put on the earth. There's nothing strange and idiosyncratic and crazy about him except his genius. Who is this Joseph Spence? He was deemed a genius. You know, I've never heard about him before. I did not know anything about Joseph Spence. Who is Spence? I don't know no Spence. <laughs> Bahamians have no idea who this person is and how big he is. Joseph Spence is my musical hero. I said, I think you're the best guitar player I ever heard. And she went, ah, ha, ha, ha. He, could, he could make the guitar talk. Joseph Spence has a cult following. He is so spectacular. That can't be just one person playing. To tell the story, we need to travel to where it all began, the island of Andros, where Joseph Spence was born on August the 3rd, 1910. Welcome to the mystical island of Andros. Back in the day when Joseph Spence was born, there was no electricity, no indoor plumbing, not even paved roads. Andros was just left in the West to develop on its own because it had no real value to our new exploiters. And therefore, everybody who wanted to get away from this exploiting ran to Andros as a safe haven of a place that they could truly explore their own freedom and escape in the new world. Life was not easy for Androsians in the early 1900s. Sponging, farming, and fishing were the only ways to survive on this remote island. But 
While the adults were toiling to make ends meet, the young people were finding creative ways to entertain themselves. These people develop their own music, their own language, their own culture, their own craft, and their own way of surviving in this new world that they took as theirs. And this is where people like Joseph Spence was born, was created. We're here in Small Hope, and this is where Joseph Spence grew up and would have been introduced to the instrument that changed his life. Catherine Minnis lives in Small Hope Andros and remembers how a young Joseph Spence would show up every day with his homemade guitar to play for anyone who would listen to him. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. He go to every sermon, every house he got his get out and be behind him and be little ping ping pong ping ping pong pong. He gets to the house, Joseph Spence sitting down there waiting. And he got a little board get out, all he got a little piece of board get out and a little string on it. So Papa said, you did well, he said, you're lowering that quick. Yeah, yeah, uncle, yeah, yeah, uncle, yeah, uncle. I, I, mean, loud, I love get out. As talented as he was, young Joseph insisted that his knack for guitar playing was compelled from some outside forces. Being out here in the pine forest of Andros, it is easy to believe in the folklore of the Chicharni and the spirits that are said to dwell in these parts. In fact, legend has it that Spence himself came face to face with a spirit that literally made him play the guitar to save his life. Somehow, he went lost in the bush. And wherever he got lost that night, he decided to spend the night because he couldn't find his way out. Okay? So, uh, according to his story, he went to sleep. So, and the spirit wake him up and teach him how to play guitar. So, he played guitar all night for the spirit. You see, I put this in the graveyard and the spirit learned me how to play these tunes sharp, sharp, and fast, fast, and quick, quick. He played guitar all night, all night, all night. And at midnight, when midnight come, he couldn't play no more music. The spirit them gone. So, he... Never play get out after midnight. And he said, if I ever play this, 12 o'clock, I ain't got no string. All my string is here, pop, 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 pop. Believe me, I've seen it with my own natural eye. 12 o'clock, every string break on Spence's guitar. He keep on pleading with me, I got to stop. Brother Wallace, I got to stop. He said, because I can't play after 12. So, whenever the midnight strike, you will never see him play get out. I don't care. What performance he performing, Midnight Young will get him playing or get out. And this is the old Anglican church. I think Spence would have attended this church. David Nemore grew up in this area of Fresh Creek Andros, where a young Joseph Spence would entertain in bars and clubs. Although he was too young to ever witness him perform, once David learned more about Spence, he literally wrote the book on the legendary guitarist. His book, Mr. Rhythm and Rhyme, is geared toward introducing young readers to this Androsian legend. I couldn't believe that a person that appeared to be so simple in the minds of those who saw him and heard him every day, but yet in the minds of those influenced by a style, so profound. And he practices that until he get, get perfect and going, traveling up and down, and everybody, everybody getting to him with them. And then you couldn't stop him no way with that, with that get hard then. Like most young people on the island, Joseph had to rely on manual labor to earn a living. So, sponge fishing and stone masonry were his main jobs, while playing guitar remained a hobby that earned him a few extra shillings or pence to put in his pocket. In Small Oak, he used to be playing the guitar there, uh, out on the beach, uh, under the big tamarind tree that he would have put the basin down and people would have dropped the money in and then he played a, play whatever music. In them days, I play everything, you know. Yeah. I play real, kapolka, waltz, tap, jazz, bock, healing to a club, law, me the show, me the hymn and anthem. All them things I play. During this time, a devastating blight virtually killed the sponging industry in the Bahamas overnight. And Joseph was forced to leave Andros and find more masonry work either in Nassau or more remote islands like Cat Island, 
where he met his wife, Louise. As a teenager, um, he started um, to travel and he met my aunt, Louise. And they lived in Cat Island for a short period of time and then they moved to the United States to work the contract. World War II brought opportunities for migrant workers in the United States. The war effort was in full swing and able-bodied Bahamians like Joseph and Louise could earn some decent money working on farms. This deal, made between the governments of the United States and the United Kingdom, was called the contract. And the Spences found themselves working in the fields of Virginia and Florida in 1944 and 45. If your hand didn't have some kind of calluses, you, you, you couldn't go. Iconic Bahamian musician and band leader Duke Errol Strawn worked in Florida on the contract in the early 1950s. That's why most of the out island fellas was, was more privileged to go because they had this farming hand, this working hand. When they went on the contract, where they put us with the, the, the living condition, terrible. I had to cook outside on a, in the tree rock. I wanted to come back home. They gave us a bed in the room, but, but um, uh, with nothing else. Although the living conditions left much to be desired, Joseph played and learned from guitarists who they themselves had been inspired by the blues, jazz, and folk artists of the American South. This only added to Spence's already impressive repertoire. When the Spences returned to the Bahamas, they settled in Nassau. Joseph continued working in construction and playing guitar. This house that Joseph built with his own hands is where he and Louise settled in Nassau and entertained family, friends, and neighbors for years. What I can recall is him riding on his bicycle and bringing with him his guitar. You would see his guitar strap on his back and we'd know that Uncle Spence was there and it was a treat. And we all knew when he was coming because the dogs would start barking because there was this gentleman riding a bicycle, okay, with a, a guitar on his back. He would grumble at them, they would bark, he would, and my mother would say, you know, Uncle Spence is almost here. The man would play all day. Wherever he went, he played. On the market wharf was his main spot. Or out on the market wharf, he playing for a drink or, or, or maybe a truppence or, or a penny, whatever you can to give him. Because in those days, a penny meant a lot. We would just sit around him, all of my siblings and I, we would sit on his lap. He played and, and he sang, but he, his, he didn't have a good voice, okay? And he rumbled and he grumbled and he made sounds. And that was humorous as a little child. It sounded like foolishness. I had no appreciation for it. He'd play that thing, boy, and he would hum he would sing, he would call some words, and he'd hum, and he'd growl and stuff like that. You know the style, right? And as kids, we enjoyed that. He could have played get up, but I'm gonna tell you now, he, he couldn't sing, because he could have sing bad. And when he get to one part, all he can say, to you, and he gave a rich whole lot out, but you can never hear the waste, nor the some of them that, that them sing he'd be singing. And he can sing the first part, and when he gets in the middle part, he can't sing back, and he know it. You know the words. He know the words. This man didn't know all the words to one song. Not one song, he didn't know. <laughs> when he starts saying, been on the rolling zero and Jesus, and he can't bring the words, big to me, dun 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 dun, been on the rolling zero, it's like he talking to, he talking a new language that ain't much people can understand. But, but the music itself, <laughs> The music itself, you know, you could understand. I don't think you know all the words to Happy Birthday, okay? But it was entertaining nevertheless. I remember his hat, I can remember his shirts. You know, just what you see in photographs, that was him. A very humble, unassuming man. I think because they lived a life with no children, uh, but they were, um, they were caretakers. They didn't have children together, but they raised the whole number of uh, nieces and nephews. He had no children, but he had many children because he went around to so many homes to spread his love. The local
locals would just gather around him as if it was a mini concert. Joseph still traveled back to Andras frequently to visit family and to work occasional construction jobs. It was on one of these trips that the outside world would finally take notice of Joseph. American musical historian Samuel Charters had been dispatched by Folkways Records to collect some field recordings in the Bahamas. And in 1958, he came upon Spence in Andros. When Moses Ash from um, Folkways Music sent the army of guys with their um, tape recorders around the world to it to capture indigenous music, uh, and Spence was the guy they found here, you know. They were looking for something that they thought was unique and they happened, they just happened upon Spence. That would have been the first time that Spence was recorded. Sam Charter says uh, in the liner notes that uh, he heard this guitar playing in the distance and he thought it was many people playing the guitar and he could not believe it was only one man and that man was Joseph Spence. This is the, the porch that he played on in 1958 that made the 1959 recordings. It was right here where he created those sounds and the, and the amazing thing about what happened here is that the songs were never edited, they were never changed. So if, if you hear them today, it was the same time and, 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 and space. He did in 1958, right here. So that's right probably here. the same wooden floor you've been tapping his foot on. Absolute, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And you can see by the uh, by the design and by the pictures in my writing and in um, Charles' writing, it's the same porch. I think that story and the description of it of them, you know, carrying recording equipment through the mud flats on their head so it didn't get ruined, shows that there was something special, there was something unheard of, there was something um, that was unique to the Bahamas that they were able to capture that one summer. You'd hear as a child, the white man came and the white man is interested and you'd hear these legends. He was in his 40s when he was discovered and so here it is this guy with so much talent, so much skills, okay, um, who just played around with the guitar for years and then someone heard him and said, hey look here, you know, uh, let's get a hold of this. In 1959, Folkways Records released the album, Music of the Bahamas Volume 1, Bahamian Folk Guitar featuring Joseph Spence. To folk music lovers, these sounds were a revelation. I was young when I first heard it. I just fell in love with it. I thought, this is just, just great. <laughs> this is amazing. I want to hear it again and again and again. I think his singing is the most joyful sound possibly ever recorded from a human being. I mean, there's just this joy he's taking in everything he's doing. I think it's like you get it or you don't get it. And I got it straight away. I love it. I've listened to it so many times. I mean, I was very young at the time in my teens when I was listening to it but I knew how it affected me, and it affected me very profoundly. I just couldn't believe Joseph's enthusiasm and joy and uh, everything, and, the, and this, un, you know, this kind of grunting and the stuff in sort of words. <laughs> he's doing the, the melody, he's doing melodies. And, and harmonies. Right, and harmonies, yeah. all at the same time. And so when you combine all, all of those, yeah. uh, all of those melodies in themselves uh, sort of created a rhythm yeah. in and of themselves. To us, that was, you know what I mean, that was like, that's, that's just Joseph, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just Joseph, but never we knew, never we knew that the music itself had that much energy. I went to this record store it's a big record store in Canada. There's records from all over the world and all languages and all that sort of thing. In the Caribbean section, I noticed that there was just one and it had the Bahamas. I got it. And this folk singer, this folk Androsian, the way that guitar is being played, the angels are playing with him because that can't be just one person playing. And let me tell you, I still get goosebumps. And it wasn't until essentially 
white people came and said, this is important, did people turn around and say, oh, I guess this is important. The wider public began to know who Uncle Spence was. And I felt so proud that I knew, I knew him before the world knew him. In 1965, two young American record producers traveled here to capture the sounds that they heard and fell in love with from Sam Charter's earlier recordings. In May of 1965, the Friends of Old Time Music collaborated with the Newport Folk Foundation to bring a group of Bahamian uh, singers mostly, as well as Spence, to New York for a concert. I took Joseph Spence to the observation deck on the top of the Empire State Building, which was the biggest building in the world at the time, and he loved it. He, uh, he bought himself a little snow globe of the Empire State Building, and later that day, we went back to the apartment where I was living with my parents at the time, and I, I recorded a number of songs. And then a couple of nights later, I recorded him at the concert. And he is so spectacular. I was so affected by the concert that I wanted to go to the Bahamas and hear that music live. I wanted to make a recording trip and see if I could put out some records. I first met him at his home in Calmersville, in Nassau, you know, to, over the hill, <laughs> as they say, it's over the hill. Uh, and um, my impression was, was a very friendly person, a very sincere, uh, easy sense of humor, very welcoming. We recorded Joseph Spence in, in his home, Louise Cottage, and we also recorded Spence with his relatives, the Pinder family, in the backyard of their home. And uh, they were all just wonderful records. I mean, you can hear it. You can hear people sitting around and listening and talking and eating Kong fritters and I'm doing drinking. whatever else. And drinking rum, of course, that's implied. You can hear me talking after one of the things we recorded on one of the records that we released where I'm saying, Spence, yeah? I said, I think you're the best guitar player I ever heard. Some persons consider him to be like one of the first, like, rappers. He tuned the top three strings a little sharp from where you'd expect them to be. And that was part of his style. Somebody offered to tune Joseph's guitar for him. So he let him tune it up and he handed it back to him and said, there, and, and Joseph just said, thank you very much, and just twisted all the keys until it sounded right to him. He was very, very busy, and he played these cascades of phrases and notes that if anybody else played that much music, they'd get in the way of the singer. But not him. He just made the singing sound better. That song, I Bid You Good Night, that we recorded that night, they didn't get proper credit for it, but it was picked up almost as an anthem. It was recorded by the Grateful Dead. It was recorded by Neville Brothers. It's just one of the most beautiful songs I ever heard. And to me, the recording by the Pinder family, and Spence is singing on it, not playing. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. Every song has got a bit of magic in it. Every, the voice inflection or a guitar lick, and some of the great old guys from you know, the States that influenced me, they, they all had it. They knew what the value, what you could get out of one guitar and a voice if you meant what you were saying. There is a visceral feeling to listening to Spence. It's just, you can't, you can't write it down. You can't you can't pinpoint anything. It's just a visceral sort of thing. He's telling you who he is. He's telling you the experience of his life. He is saying, I work hard, but God knows I'm free. I work hard and I know I don't get what I deserve, but you know what? I will work this hard and take less, less for it to have my freedom. And that I will celebrate in my music and express it. Spence's music was out in the world now, garnering more and more attention. But in the Bahamas, he still remained your average Joe. Nice.
Oswald Poitier is an Androgian musician who was fortunate enough to play and perform at Spence and to see his greatness close up. We would assume that a person as gifted, as talented as he was, he, the man was a genius. And yet, Fred, you know this man personally, the most humble person you ever met. This man that I grew up with as a little young boy, uh, and I take for granted, that is, that is worldwide. I was at the University of Dallas, and I was in a shopping mall to purchase a, an album. And I saw a couple of albums by Joe Suspense. And it was like, wait, this can't be the same person, but yes, it was. Joe Suspense is all around the world, and we never, the, the, our, our immediate family don't even know. I heard about a guitarist who was uh, from the Bahamas. Chris Justillian is a music professor at the University of the Bahamas. Back when he was a student, he couldn't find any materials on this mysterious Bahamian guitarist that he had been hearing about. I went in the Center for Black Research Studies at the Columbia University, and I just dug up a lot of information on him. I did not know anything about Joseph Spence. That's pretty common amongst, amongst most Bahamians. It was rather disappointing for me because at such a such an age when you're in, 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 in college or university and you're involved in music and you don't know much or anything about someone who has so much to offer. And from your country. And from my own country. For 40 years I've been singing Joe Spence praises and people, uh, you know, the Bahamians are like, who? And, um, you know, because he didn't really do the whole uh, touristy thing. Steve Holden is an American artist and musician that relocated to the Bahamas in the early 1980s. Steve has incorporated Spence's techniques and styles into his playing and also uses Joseph's music as inspiration when he paints. There's a primitiveness that a lot of people dismiss, that it's like, nah, you know, a kid could do that kind of stuff or whatever, and it's not really recognized, but you know, for artists to realize the purity of that. So he's been very influential in your art fully, not just the painting, but in your songwriting sure. as well. Yeah. When I paint my island kind of feel stuff, I, I got Spence playing in the background, and I paint with the rhythm. Yes. With dun, 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 and so, yeah. I'm a Joseph Spence evangelist. I think I like to look at it like that. Dwight Ferguson is another local artist inspired by Spence's music. Some of his work is not only influenced by Joseph, but are his literal interpretations of the songs. Even though he's a musical artist, and I'm a visual artist, I draw inspiration from his music as if he was a visual artist. There was something beyond the realm of just this person playing the guitar, and I was hearing deeper. This piece is called Happy All The Time, and this is a tribute to Joseph, Joseph Spence. It kind of just lends to who Joseph is, minimalistic, simple, uh, a person who is not overwhelmed and challenged with life in its, you know, per se, but, but there's another dynamic to this piece. So when you look at, when you look at this, you see the simplicity, but then when it gets to this portion here, this band, his music represents something I think that's different than his personality. His personality is simplistic, but Joseph's music is, is not complicated, but it's complex. Something that is full of joy and glee and is gay in color uh, and movement and feel. Happy all the time. Tribute to my friend. Uh, I never met him but I still consider him my friend, Joseph Spence. This piece is called I Bid You Good Night. I'm also a pastor as well, so I'm going to the chapel, maximum security chapel, and I'm walking through this corridor, and somehow Joseph's song connected to my thoughts and feelings, because there has to be a glimmer of hope for you to live in a, in a four by eight cell every single day, in the midst of all that the smell and seemingly decay, and loss, there's got to be some glimmer of hope. And I connected that song, I Bid You Good Night, to that experience.
After Stecker and Siegel released The Real Bahamas 1 and 2 and Summer of 65, to go along with the previously released Folkways recordings and Happy All the Time, Spence now had a legitimate body of work. He was invited to tour the U.S. and play at concerts and festivals along with some A-list performers. You know, he was scheduled for one song on the main stage and maybe a workshop or two. He wasn't concerned about that. He just stood in the middle of a field and began playing and gathered a big crowd around him. And he just played and sang. I even sang with him. Elijah Wald is an author and folk musician who has produced an instructional video on Spence's playing techniques. He actually saw Joseph perform when he was 12 years old. And I saw this poster, I was 12 years old for a concert. So I went to it and then they announced, and now from the Bahamas, Joseph Spence, and I said, oh my God, it's the man on my brother's record. Because I loved that record. The whole concert was just magical. But it was like, I got to see Joseph Spence. He would come back and he would talk about the rave reviews and he would talk about how people had an appreciation for him. But for me as a, as a teenager, it was like, why? While Bahamians may not have seen the artistic value of Joseph Spence, folk music fans and other musicians were blown away by this middle-aged Bahamian who showed up on their scene. If it wasn't for Joseph, Roy Kuda would not have the, the, the particular style that he's got. And, and so many people try to copy Roy Kuda and, in his economy and his harmony. And, so, and he says quite openly, you know, well, it's Joseph Spence. Joseph Spence is a, a great uh, genius on the guitar, lives in the Bahamas. He's a bricklayer down there, plays guitar for a hobby. Probably the finest uh, primitive musician in the world today. <clears throat> Sometimes he comes to the United States and does concerts. Most of the time he, he'd rather stay home, I think, though. Has a pretty nice life. People bring him chickens and pigs and cookies, and he, they feed him and he plays music. He just got a kick out of the fact that he was playing music and people were listening. It's a different thing than stardom. He did have a chance, though. In 1975, representatives from Carnegie Hall tried to reach Joseph to invite him to come and play a series of concerts in the iconic New York venue. It didn't go exactly as they planned when they finally tracked Joseph down. I was working at Aquinas College. I, I just graduated and I started working as a bursar. So I was in the office and I got this phone call and um, I took the call and the person said that they were calling from Carnegie Hall and I thought, yeah, right, Carnegie Hall. And um, so they said, yes, we are trying to find Joseph Spence. And I said, I don't, I don't know who Joseph Spence is. So they said, well, we would like you to do us a favor. If you go out of the schoolyard in the back and you walk a certain distance and you go to wherever, you will come to his house. So I leave the office and I walk through the gate, the back gate, and I go around and I come to the house that they've given me directions to. And this gentleman is sitting on the porch. There's a hat, there's a pipe. And I said, I'm looking for Mr. Joseph Spence. And he said, I am Mr. Joseph Spence. I said, okay. I said, um, so I got a call. And before I could even get it out, he said, Carnegie Hall, right? <laughs> so he was like, yeah, these people are always trying to get in touch with me, man. I, I, I'm not, I, I, just let them know that, you know, I, 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 for that, I'm ready for that right now. And I stood there, my mouth dropped, and I just left and I went back. And I said, I'm sorry, but Mrs. Spence says he's not interested. <laughs> that was it. People came to seek him out. He didn't have to go out into the world and become B.B. King or Harry Belafonte. Uh, people who played with those guys came to sit at his feet here. He didn't have to go anywhere. For him, what is Carnegie Hall? But that should, that should really say something to us. Here is something that the world was clamoring for. We continue to reinforce that the persons who should be of value in their own home have to leave. That's the old saying, right? That's the adage, a prophet is never appreciated in his home. 
I sometimes wonder if, if he couldn't have gone further. If, if there's one downfall, I think it happened there. The, he didn't realize his potential and, and didn't maximize it. He was a person that he would uh, share his music with anyone. And to him it's just having fun. Uh, he settled for, for just having enough to get by, for just minimal recognition for just playing in a club. I don't think he was necessarily business savvy in terms of um, the music industry, but also I don't think he wanted to be a career musician either. Money back then to him was in nothing. Happiness was more value than money. Because when he put a smile on your face with his music and, and stuff like that, that's what make you happy. In exchange for his airfare to get to the U.S., he gave up his rights to the album, essentially, um, to go play at those festivals in the Northeast. Right around his 60th birthday, Joseph suffered a heart attack. Although he recovered, he was forced to slow down. Now, instead of construction or touring and playing concerts, he worked as a security guard at a nearby primary school to make ends meet. My mother-in-law was a teacher at the Oaks Hill Primary, and she recounted to me how he would be practicing in the security booth all day, and the students running all about, paying no attention, paying no attention because this old man singing these songs that they probably uh, didn't really want to hear, they wanted to hear the popular songs of the day. We don't see culture and music on the whole as something uh, that important to be celebrated. So someone uh, this, this influential really means nothing. We've had people knighted who, for no other reason than their political connections, you know, the f queen did this, or however she does it, right? And then you have people who made a tangible contribution to the culture in this country. And we have a hard time remembering who the hell they were. I've been listening to some elements of Joseph for 30 years, and when I listen to it, there is something that is new about it. It has to be appreciated, but also has to be taught. You know, and I think we have to make that connection with this next generation. At some point, we decided that we're gonna turn and please the tourists, and we decided this was too raw. This was too raw for our tourists, so let's hide that and let's make this pretty. On March 18th, 1984, Joseph Spence passed away after battling prostate cancer. He was 73. His funeral was, was small. It was, um, it was kind of disappointing because when you think back uh, to this, his greatness, you would have expected um, a little bit more. It's just a shame that we don't have him as a national hero. We should be the first. We should be proud to promote Joseph Spence, the legend, and his music. He needs a bust um, prominently displayed somewhere. I think um, we can even call our National Performing Arts Center the Joseph Spence Performing Arts Center. Perhaps the most fitting tribute to Joseph is a song. British guitarist and folk singer Ralph McTell wrote a personal thank you to Spence with the song, The Hands of Joseph. I felt it's part of my job to write thank you notes in songs to the people that have influenced me. So I have written a song for Joseph. And, and that's, you know, so when I sit on stage, I, I like to say, well, this is where this comes from. These are my teachers. I would have never knew that. When we completed our interview with Sammy Ramming and Andros, we showed him the video of Ralph paying tribute to his great uncle. Yeah, and I'm rolling to see when Jesus speak to me. Wow. Man, that brings tears to my eyes. Yeah, what do you think of you? Yeah.
Technology has propelled us forward, of course, but it is also helping us to look back. With the prevalence of YouTube, guitarists worldwide are connecting and discovering Spence. One of Joseph's biggest fans is Katsuhiro Okubo from Okinawa, Japan. <laughs> I've learned how to play Joseph Spence's music by ear. After I've uploaded my videos to YouTube, people from all over the world are now watching and enjoying Spence's music too. It makes me very happy to see that there are so many people all over the world that enjoy Spence's music. While the rest of the world has been more receptive to Joseph's music than here in the Bahamas, there is new hope for his legacy in his homeland, as younger Bahamians look to build on what Spence left behind. Yeah. It inspired me, obviously his playing, but also saddened me at the same time to see how little um, his music and his, his art was appreciated here, you know? I was convinced that there were two guitar players playing, like, the amount of melodies and counter melodies he played at the same time, like, in my head, there was no possible way that only one person could be playing that. Just to have somebody who from the Bahamas doing this type of stuff was just, like, come on, I have to, like, <laughs> I have to get up to this standard. So that's what really inspired me to learn about Spence. I want to be able to perform his music at at least a similar level to what he did because you know you could never really get to his you know that that feel is his sound that mm -hmm. is impossible to really reach that level but and and maybe to even teach 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 other young guitar players and and musicians about his style and his music Thanks to this next generation, Spence's legacy seems secure. But even if none of us ever learn how to play like him, I think in a way that's how Spence would have wanted it. Because there's a Joseph Spence in all of us that wants us to use our own gifts and be inspired to be the best version of ourselves. Even if we are a little out of tune. Joseph Spence was a stonemason. A Bahamian, true and true Now Joseph Spence is a guitar god And now you know that too like that.